Hello, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Anurekha Charivag, Assistant Professor, Department of Sociology, Savitri Bhai Phule, Pune University. I am coordinating the paper on Sociology of Gender. Today, in this paper, we are going to discuss a module titled Marxist and Socialist Feminism. In this module, we would discuss the basic postulates of Marxian model of class oppression and then also try to explore the gender blind nature of oppression which has been conducted using a Marxian lens. Thus, based upon and developing on the inadequacies of Marxism, the whole idea of socialist feminism that kind of related both capitalism and patriarchy together in order to have a much better understanding of women's subordination is what the paper is going to discuss on. Introduction Interdisciplinary and intersectionality have been influencing feminist theorizing since inception. Feminist theorizing has been reshaped by multiple mainstream theoretical perspectives in its understanding of women's oppression. Inability of the liberal welfareism and the radical patriarchal feminist agendas of women's liberation paved the ways for Marxist and socialist feminism. Marxist and socialist feminists claim that it is impossible for women to achieve true freedom in a class-based capitalist society where the powerless many that produce the wealth are deprived of it. Private ownership of the means of production by a relatively few persons, originally all male, inaugurated a class system whose contemporary manifestations are corporate capitalism and imperialism. Reflection on this state of affairs suggests that capitalism itself and not just the larger social rules that privilege men over women is a cause of women's oppression. Women's true liberation demands the capitalist system must be replaced by a socialist system in which the means of production belong to everyone. No longer economically dependent on men, the women will be just as free as men. Basic tenets of Marxism, subordination of gender perspective under class. Marxism based on the influential works of Karl Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto. Marx in a contribution to the critique of political economy and Engels in the origin of family, private property and the state regarding classism rather than sexism as a fundamental cause of women's oppression. For the Marxist material forces, the production and reproduction of social life are the prime movers in society. In other words, Marx believed a society's total mode of production, that is, its forces of production, the raw material, tools and workers that actually produce goods, plus its relations of production, the ways in which production is organized, generates a superstructure, a layer of legal, political and social ideas that in turn reinforces the mode of production. Marx and Angel focus on a class struggle as the driving forces of history. They paid scant attention to sex class. Shulamit Firestone, a radical feminist following Marxian dialectics, claimed that the material basis for the sexual political ideology of female submission and male domination was rooted in the reproductive roles of men and women. She proposed to make up for this by developing a feminist version of historical materialism in which sex, class rather than economic class is a central concept. Firestone said it would take a major biological and social revolution to affect this kind of human liberation. According to Marxist feminists, women's liberation can only be achieved through a radical restructuring of the current capitalist economy in which much of the women's labor is uncompensated and invisible. In the capitalist system, two types of labor exist. Followed by angels, Marxist feminists like Margaret Benston and Peggy Morton stressed on. Productive labor, in which the labor results in goods or services that have monetary value in the capitalist system and are thus compensated by the producers in form of a paid wage. Reproductive labor, which is associated with the private sphere and involves anything that people have to do for themselves that is not for the purposes of receiving a wage, that is cleaning, cooking, having children. Angels, the origin of family, private property and the state. Although the fathers of Marxism did not take women's oppression as seriously as they did workers' oppression, but angels did offer explanations for women's oppression. Angels in the origin of family, private property and the state showed how changes in the material conditions of people affect the organization of the family relations. Angels speculated that primitive hunting, gathering, promiscuous societies may have been not merely matrilineal but also matriarchal societies in which women ruled at the political, social and economic levels. Only when the site of production changed, women lost their advantage position. Angels said a site change did not occur with the advent of agriculture, domestication of animals and breeding of herds. Somehow the male-female power balance shifted in favor of men as men learned to produce more 
than enough animals to meet the tribe's needs for milk and meat. As men's work and production grew in importance, the value of women's work, production and status of women decreased. With the newfound social status, suddenly men wanted their own biological children by imposing control on pre-existing free female sexuality to get their positions and exerted enormous pressure to convert society from a matrilineal one into a patrilineal one. Angels presented the overthrow of mother right at the world historic defeat of the female sex. In this new familial order, said angels, the husband ruled by the virtue of his economic power. He is the bourgeois and the wife represents the proletariat. Angels believe men's power over women is rooted in men's control over private property. He believed that the oppression of women will cease only with the dissolution of the institutions of private property. From Marxism to Marxist Feminism Classical Marxist feminists work within the conceptual terrain laid out by Marx, Angels, Lenin and other 19th century thinkers. During the communist revolution of 1917 in Russia, women were invited to enter the productive workforce with the expectation that economic independence would increase the possibility of women's developing self-confidence and wing themselves as makers of a meaningful human history. But it was disturbingly found that relegation of most women to low status women's work Secretarial, road factory work, service work included jobs relating to cooking, cleaning, caring for the basic needs of the young, old and the infirm. Reconfirmation of the sexual division of labor through the creation of female profession and male profession. Payment of lower wages to women than the wages paid to men. Treatment of women as a colossal reserve of labor forces to use or not to use depending upon the state's need for workers. Like Marxist in general, Marxist feminists claim that social existence determines consciousness. Thus, Marxist feminists believe that we need to analyze the links between women's work status and women's self-image in order to understand the unique character of women's oppression. According to Marx, capitalist ideologies lead workers and employers to focus on capitalism's surface structure of exchange relations, where workers gradually convince themselves that even though their money is very hard-earned, there is nothing inherently wrong with the specific exchange relations into which they have entered. But as Marxist and socialist feminists see it, when a poor, illiterate, unskilled woman chooses to sell her sexual or reproductive services, chances are her choice is more coerced than free. Marx observed that every class divided political economy right from the primitive communal state, slave society, the pre-capitalist society to the capitalist society till date contains the seeds of its own destruction. According to Marx, when these two groups of people, the haves and the have-nots, both become conscious of them as classes, class struggle begins and ultimately topples the system that produces these classes. As Marxist and socialist feminists wish to view women as a collectivity, Marxist teachings on class and class consciousness play a large role in Marxist and socialist feminist thought. A Marxist answer to the question of women's oppression would point to the sexual division of labor and the implication of this division for power differential between women and men. By widening the Marxist conception of reproduction to include household labor and child care, feminists like Margaret Benston, Dalla Costa, Selma Jane, Sylvia Valby and Clara Zetkin made important major contribution to our understanding of the interaction of gender and economy. Socialization of domestic work Margaret Winston defined women as that class of people responsible for the production of simple use values in the activities associated with the house and family. Focusing on women's exclusion from productive labor as the most important source of female oppression, some Marxist feminists argued for the inclusion of domestic work within the waged capitalist economy. According to Winston, feminists plan for women's liberation through bringing women into the productive workforce will be thwarted if it is not simultaneously supported by socializing the jobs of cooking, cleaning and childcare. To be sure, she concluded, socialization of domestic work might lead women during the same sorts of female work outside the home as they do inside the home but with remuneration and recognition. Wage employment will increase men's chance of taking up those jobs and thereby increasing the status of these works as well. Wages for housework Marxist feminist thinkers Dalla Costa and James claim that women's work inside the home creates surplus value. The reason that women's domestic work is necessary condition for all other labor from which in turn surplus value is extracted. By providing not only food and clothes but also emotional comfort to the current and future workers, women keep the clocks of the capitalist machine running. Therefore, Dalla Costa and James argued that the men's employers should pay women's wages for housework they do. 
the suggestion attracted lot of criticism from within and outside feminist discourse. Complexities associated with the modalities of payment of wages for the housework make it untenable and not all and not even most women in advanced capitalist economies are stay at home domestic workers. If they have to pay wages for housework, employers would probably pay housewife husbands lower wages if they have to most small companies would probably go out of business. Some feminists argued that if the housework becomes remunerative then it may thwart women's education and other productive intellectual activities thereby subverting the process of women's liberation. It may also push them more within the four walls of home. Comparative worth. Marxist feminists have found that their attention on the inequitable manner in which the sexual division of labor operates within the society in a capitalist world where men and women are differentially paid for doing the comparable work. Job where concentrations of women are more attracts much lesser remuneration in comparison to the job dominated by men. Marxist feminists view this having far-reaching consequences on mitigating feminization of poverty. Emergence of Socialist Feminism A synthesis of Marxist feminism, radical and psychoanalytic feminism. Social feminism in its quest for origin combines Marxist radical and psychoanalytical feminism. Socialist feminism on the one hand broadens the Marxist feminist gender blindness in explaining the role of capitalism in the operation of women. On the other hand includes radical feminism's idea of the role of the gender and patriarchy in subjugating women. While Marxist and radical feminists emphasize macro-social aspects of women's oppression, psychoanalytical feminists in their respective explanation of their women's oppression emphasizes that the roots of women oppression are embedded deep in the female psyche. Considering Ferdinand and Oedipus complex as a root of male rule or patriarchy, some psychoanalytic feminists speculate that the Oedipus complex is nothing more than the product of men's imagination, a psychic trap that everyone, especially women, should try to escape. Others like Ottner, Dorothy Dannestein, Nancy Chaudhry, accept some version of the Oedipus complex as the experience that integrates the individual into society. They opinion dual parenting and dual participation in the workforce would change the gender balances of the Oedipus complex. Authority, autonomy and universalism would no longer be the exclusive property of men. Love, dependence and particularism would no longer be the exclusive property of women. The socialist feminist sees women's liberation as a necessary part of a larger quest for socio-economic and political action. For Marxist to socialist feminism. Influenced by the historical materialism, socialist feminists consider how the sexism and gender division of labor of each historical era is determined by the economic system of time. These conditions are largely expressed through capitalist and patriarchal relations. Socialist feminists thus reject the Marxist notion that class and class struggle are the only defining aspects of history and economic development. To understand socialist feminism, one must understand praxis. Praxis is a Marxist concept which means that the ability that human has to consciously change the environment in order to meet their needs. Socialist feminists like Marxist feminists hold that praxis is the one thing universal to all humans. Unlike Marxist feminists, social feminists hold that praxis has a gender specific forms and extends to the private sphere of life. Unlike Marxist feminist theory, socialist feminists believe that the home is just not a place of consumption but of production as well. Women's work within the home, having and raising children, as well as supporting men by doing cooking, cleaning and other forms of housework which permit men to work outside the home are all forms of production because they contribute to the society at large. Production according to socialist feminists should not be measured in dollars but rather in social worth. Socialist feminists agree with both Marxist feminists that uh, capitalism is a source of women's oppression and with radical feminists that patriarchy is a source of women's oppression. Therefore, the way to end women's oppression in socialist feminist estimation is to kill the two-headed beast of capitalist patriarchy or patriarchal capitalism. Motivated by this goal, socialist feminists seek to develop theories that explain the relationship between capitalism and patriarchy. To overcome the limits of traditional Marxist feminism on the one hand and of radical and psychoanalytic feminism on the other, socialist feminists have developed two different approaches, dual system theory and unified system theory. Dual systems theory. Dual system theorists maintain that patriarchy and capitalism are distinct forms of social relation and distinct set of interests which when they intersect oppress women far more. 
for women's oppression to be fully understood both patriarchy and capitalism must be analyzed first as a separate phenomena then as a phenomena that dialectically relate to each other although all dual systems theorists describe capitalism as a material structure or a historically rooted mode of production only some describe patriarchy as a material structure or historically rooted mode of production or sexuality others describe patriarchy as a non material structure that is largely ideological a psychoanalytical structure that transcends the contingency of space and time a non materialist account of patriarchy plus a materialist account of capitalism Juliet Mitchell is an example of a dual system theorist who coupled a non-materialist account of patriarchy with a materialist account. Mitchell's conception of patriarchy was non-material because some of the aspects of women's life within the family are economic, results of the change in the mode of production across space and time, while others are biosocial, the result of interplay between female biology and the social environment, and the other still is ideological, the result of ideas of society has about the way in which women should relate to men in spite of the changes in the mode of production these biosocial and ideological aspects will remain essentially the same thus even under socialism women will remain somewhat oppressed under the defeat of capitalism and is accompanied by the defeat of patriarchy she has suggested that while economic aspects of patriarchy can be altered by material means its biosocial and ideological aspects can be altered only by non material means through a rewriting of the psycho sexual drama a materialist account of patriarchy plus a materialist account of capitalism hd e. hartman defined patriarchy as a set of social relations between men which have material base this material base rests in men's historical control over women's labor power this control is constituted by restricting women's access to important economic resources and by disallowing women any control over female sexuality especially female reproductive capacities men's control over women's labor power varies from society to society and across time it appears for example in the shape of a woman's need to please her husband so that he does not leave her and the children or in the shape of woman's need to please her boss so that he does not fire her marxist analysts predicts that patriarchy will either wither away in the face of capitalism's need to pluritarianize everyone a feminist analysis predicts that capitalism and patriarchy will reach some sort of compromise on the women's question reflecting on the present sexual division of labor which results in the underpayment and overwork of women hartman concluded that men's desire to control women is at least as strong as capital's desire to control workers Capitalism and patriarchy are not two heads of the same beast they are different beasts each of which must be fought with different weapons unified systems theory according to tong in contrast to the dual system theorists unified system theorists attempt to analyze capitalism and patriarchy together through the use of one concept according to these theorists capitalism is no more separate from patriarchy than the mind is from body this is even more ambitious form of socialist feminism than is the dual system approach for there is one conceptual lens through which all of the dimensions of women's oppression can be filtered then it may be possible to unite all of the feminist perspectives a gender division of labor as a unifying concept young believe that the feminist who wishes to avoid the pitfalls of the dual system approach to capitalist patriarchy need to develop a new core concept for marxist theory suggested that the gendered category division of labor has the conceptual power to transform marxist feminist theory into socialist feminist theory which is powerful enough to accommodate the insights of marxist radical and psychoanalytic feminist in unitary framework according to young a division of labor analysis has the advantage of being more specific than a class analysis division of labor requires a detailed and very concrete discussion of for example who gives the orders and who takes them who does the stimulating work and who does the drudge work who works a desirable shift and who works a undesirable shift who gets paid more and who gets paid less division of labor analysis can better explain why women usually take the orders to do drudge work work the undesirable shift to get paid less while men usually give the orders all these analysis really suggest that it is a marxist class analysis that can be supplemented by a feminist division of labor analysis as young saw it capitalism is very much aware of its workers gender gap race and ethnicity because a large number of reserve of the unemployed workers is necessary to keep the wages low and to meet unanticipated demands for increased supplies of goods and services 
capitalism has both implicit and explicit criteria for determining who shall constitute its primary employed workforce and who shall act as its secondary unemployed workforce. Capitalism has its own patriarchal criteria of identifying men as primary workforce material and women as secondary workforce material. Because women were needed at a home in a way men were not, so patriarchy concluded that women were freer to work outside home than men were. Alienation as a unifying concept. Alison Jagger was working towards unified systems theory and like Young, she advanced a concept other than the class as an important Marxist concept. In her book Feminist Politics and Human Nature, Jagger identified alienation as a concept that will provide us with a theoretical framework powerful enough to accommodate the main insights of Marxist radical and psychoanalytical and even liberal feminist thought. Under capitalism, work becomes a dehumanizing activity. Jagger organized a discussion of women's alienation, her fragmentation splintering under the ages of sexuality, motherhood and intellectuality. Under capitalism, the wage, a wage worker is alienated or separated from the product he produces. A woman is also alienated from the product upon which she works, her body. A woman may think that by dieting, exercising and dressing, she is beautifying herself, but in reality, she is probably shaping and adorning her flesh for the satisfaction of others, especially men. Many a time, a woman has little or no say about the control and use of her body. This process of commodification objectifies the worker, considering him as a mere machine from which the labor power is attracted and women a tool of satisfaction for men and intensifies undue competition among them. Motherhood like sexuality is also an alienating experience for women. According to Jagger, the way a worker is alienated from the product he produces, a woman is alienated from the product of her reproductive labor when instead of her, someone else decides how many children she should have. Jagger continued that as labors have no control or identification with the process of production in a highly technical assembly like production under capitalism, women are also alienated from the process of their reproductive labor. With the advent of most sophisticated technological instruments under new reproductive technologies, women are likely to be further alienated from the birth and the process of childbirth. Child rearing like childbearing is an alienating experience when scientific experts more of whom are male, not women, take charge of it. As Jagger saw it, the pressure on mothers is enormous because virtually no assistance, they are supposed to execute every edict of the experts. Proper mothering impedes the growth of friendship between women as mothers compete with each other to produce and process the perfect child. Finally, Jagger said, not only are there many women alienated from their own sexuality and from the product and the process of motherhood, they are also alienated from their intellectual capacities. A woman is made to feel and so sure of herself that she hesitates to express her ideas in public for the fear that her thoughts are not worth expressing and fearing that she will be exposed as a pretender, not possessor of knowledge. To the same degree that Young was convinced that a gender division of labor is essential to capitalism, Jagger believed that the use of theoretical framework of alienation identifies women's contemporary cooperation as a phenomenon peculiar to the capitalist form of male dominance. Jagger concluded that although the overthrow of capitalism might end women as well as men as men's exploitation in the productive workforce, it would not end women's alienation from everything and everyone, especially themselves. Only overthrow of patriarchy would enable women to become full persons. Contemporary Socialist Feminism Like Young and Hartman, Sylvia Wallby saw patriarchy is located in six somewhat independent structures. Unpaid domestic work, wage labor, culture, sexuality, male violence and state. These structures and the relative importance vary from one historical era to another. While we noted, for example, that patriarchy oppressed women mostly in the private sphere of domestic production during the 19th century and mostly in the public sphere of wage labor and the state in the 20th century. According to her, modernization of the gender regime, that is, women's entry into the productive labor force, along with men, is creating a new political constituency of working women who have vocalized their perceived interest in policies to assist combining home and work. Along with the invisibility of women's work at home, contemporary socialist feminists have focused on the gender pay gap and often the oppressive nature of women's work in the so-called global factory. According to Nancy Holstrom, the brutal economic realities of globalization impact everyone across the globe, 
but women are affected disproportionately. Displaced by economic changes, women bear a greater burden of labor throughout the world as social services have been cut. Women, whether in response to structural adjustment plans in the third world or the so-called welfare reform in the United States. Socialist feminism in Indian context. Socialist feminism help us to understand women's operation in caste and class in Indian society in the most egregious ways. A Dalit woman worker in a garment export unit is oppressed not just because of her proletarian status in the capitalist mode of production, she is often oppressed due to her vulnerable caste and gender identity in a patriarchal system. She often finds herself in a monotonous, long duration, low remuneration job in a woman intensive organization controlled by minority men. Global vulnerability of capital and withdrawal of state from social sector under structural adjustment often exacerbate her vulnerability. Critiques of Marxist and Socialist Feminism Marxism's economic determinism and inability to distinguish between economic class and sex class attracts lots of criticism. Given women's distinctively unprivileged position in the workplace, it is somewhat difficult to understand why, beginning in the 1970s, many feminists, including some Marxist feminists, abandoned materialist explanations of women's oppression. They turn into a, into a psychological explanation for women's oppression, explanation that could answer the question as to why women's status remains low, irrespective of the political and economic character of the society in which we live. Juliet Mitchell rejected the claim of Marxist feminists that an economic revolution aimed at overthrowing capitalism will make men and women full partners. Marxist feminists considered women as a part of working class and emphasized more in the economic sphere rather than paying attention to women's experience in the domestic sphere. Mitchell explained that attitudes towards women will never really change as long as both male and female psychologies are dominated by the phallic symbol. Radical feminism have criticized capitalist modes of exploitation. Radical feminists argue that patriarchal forms of exploitation have existed in all known societies, not just capitalist ones. Cultural analysts and postmodernists were explicitly critical of materialist explanations of women's oppression. Discourse and language is considered essential to interpret women's identity and activity as there is no unity to women or to women's oppression, and that differing discourses simply constructed varying definitions of women. The significance of capitalist forms of exploitation is underplayed in socialist forms of feminism. Socialist feminism is criticized for being neither revolutionary nor radical enough to create lasting solutions to the problem of female economic and social exploitation. After hearing about the whole ideas in terms of Marxism and Marxist and socialist feminism, we have got a broad idea about Marxism and socialist feminism, especially also its critiques. We have discussed the whole concept in terms of alienation, capitalism, production and reproductive labor, sexual division of labor, socialization of domestic work, wages for housework, also the whole contemporary socialist feminism. And finally, we have also discussed the socialist feminism in India, especially in the Indian context. Thank you.